Well, happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome to the Eight Pillars of Successful Landscape Companies. Today is the third installment of our webinar series. In uh, So three-part webinar series that we've delivered the last three weeks. Uh, today, we're diving into how leadership drives core business operations for success. You know, really, there's no uh, magic bullet in business for success. In fact, in every recipe for success, some of the main ingredients are planning and hard work. Uh, so in this webinar series, um, I'm just gonna offer some insight, what I've seen uh, successful landscape companies do, what I've seen uh, landscape companies do that haven't been successful. Uh, and uh, you know, over my career, I've had the opportunity to uh, see a couple hundred landscape companies and how they operate. And um, so I'm taking that experience and distilling it down. My name's Joe Salemi uh, with Dynascape Software here. Dynascape Software, really think of it as a completely integrated system for many, many types of landscape companies, whether you do design only uh, or your full service or maintenance only or only do design build and sub out your design. We have software solutions that are right for you. And really at the end of the day, it's our uh, objective to help uh, you increase efficiency, improve capacity and boost profit. So the details about this webinar series, we've been running them Tuesdays at one. Today is the last one, the uh, final installment here in our eight pillars of successful landscape companies. We've recorded the previous two and I'm recording them now. Um, and we will post uh, today's webinar on our website uh, and that link will be emailed to you. If you haven't seen the recordings, definitely let me know. Um, but I have been emailing them out uh, usually later in the afternoon, um, but you will also get an email today with the recording of today's webinar. They're all on the exact same page. If you have not been there yet, uh, I'll just show you what they look like. Uh, and so <clears throat> on the Dynascape website, uh, you can find it under uh, resources and blog. Uh, it's eight pillars of successful landscape companies. And we've got webinar one, which where we focused on people, culture, and customers. Webinar two, we focused on proven sales and marketing principles that lead to real wins. Uh, so those recordings are there. So we post them on YouTube uh, and then embed them in our blog here. So today's webinar will go right here. Uh, if you have questions, please do ask. There's a Q and A um, box in the Zoom control panel. Definitely type in your questions there. Definitely be uh, happy to try and answer those. I'll definitely uh, keep an eye on that uh, panel box so that uh, if you do have questions, um, they will pop up for me and um, I'll do my best uh, to answer those for you. Uh, and if you do have questions following the webinar, definitely reach out, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, if you are uh, certified through the National Association of Landscape Professionals, each one of these webinars qualifies for one continuing education credit. And what I'm told from NALP is that you're responsible for submitting, submitting your own CEUs, but we have been approved for uh, CEUs for a total of three. So if you need any help um, with that, let me know and I can definitely help facilitate that for you. I'm Joe Salami, and this is me. And been in the industry for a little over 16 years now, uh, studying landscape companies from all over North America. And really I'm responsible here for driving um, strategic direction and um, working through day-to-day -day operations. And I've really worked with our team here to grow Dynascape to be one of the top landscape companies serving the professional landscape industry. So on deck for today, eight pillars of successful landscape companies. Um, we're looking at landscape operations and all about the details. We're gonna dig into overhead. We're going to look at current estimating trends, break evens, um, average markups and profit. We're gonna be looking at um, how professional landscape design uh, wins more jobs. We're gonna be looking at really all encompassing the job and we're gonna take a look at change orders, tracking actuals, what reports you should be looking at and why it's important to keep score with your team. 
So <clears throat> this webinar series focusing on the eight pillars of successful landscape companies. What exactly are those eight pillars? I had someone ask me before. So we're looking at leadership, people, culture, customers, sales, marketing, business, and operations. And today, the two that we're focusing on is business and operations. So landscape business operations, uh, really successful operations are really highly organized. Everybody knows their job. Uh, everybody knows the importance of their job and just knows that they have to do what, that they have an obligation to do uh, what they were hired to do and know how to do their job um, without asking. So one of the um, great examples recently um, is uh, Bill Belichick, the head coach of the uh, New England Patriots. Um, back in October this year, he won his 300th game. And it's not by coincidence. And in that game, um, there was a uh, flag that was thrown. Um, and I forget the actual, what, the, what the actual uh, penalty was uh, and how, what the term was. But you can see here, so they're playing the Cleveland Browns. And this line that's along the sidelines, and for anyone that's a, a football fan, uh, you'll know this. And you can see the same line here. And this is the uh, Patriots uh, side of the field. The flag was thrown against the Cleveland Browns. And look how disorganized they are. A significant portion of the team is considered on the field past this yellow line where the majority of the New England Patriots just know that they shouldn't be past that line. So, but why? At the end of the day, it comes down to the leadership and helping everybody understand the importance of their job. Everybody on the Patriots knew that as part of their job on, on being on the sidelines is to be behind that line and just wasn't made clear what, what from what it seems to the Cleveland Browns. So, um, it's all about the details and, you know, a million details for Bill Belichick led up to 300 wins for him. So some keys to this example are really learning how to lose before you know how to win. Uh, really helps you understand what, you know, what not to do so that uh, you can be successful. And making sure just everyone knows how crucial their job is to the success of the entire organization. from those in the office that are uh, managing the day-to-day -day, uh, in the office and making sure that the admin work is taken care of and that uh, everybody needs to be where they should be. From the crew um, to the mechanic, if you have a mechanic on site, uh, as, as long as everybody knows how crucial their role is uh, to the success of the organization, that, that's really important. And it's up to the leaders uh, of these lands of the successful landscape companies of any landscape company really to make sure that everyone knows how crucial their role is and that there are consequences to sloppiness uh, in this case the cleveland browns their consequence was a 10-year penalty you know it, it set them back so uh, make sure everyone knows what the consequences are to sloppiness in the landscape industry, some of the consequences could be safety related. It could result in injuries, you know, if not worse. So uh, making sure that everyone understands what the consequences to sloppiness are. And really true leaders empower their people to perform to the best of their, their ability. So empower your people, provide them and arm them with the knowledge that they need and the training uh, and the scaffolding so that they can perform to the absolute best of their ability. Teach your chiefs. So your chiefs are your crew leaders, your supervisors, your operations managers. Uh, and the idea here is for landscape business owners so that, you know, you don't have to be the single point of contact for absolutely everything. You know, I've seen some really successful landscape companies where they have production managers or operations managers, supervisors. They can all finish the sentence of the owner of the landscape company. So they've been um, part of the vision. They've bought into the vision and the mission of the company. They understand the landscape company's why and its purpose and its mandate. 
and they're just completely keyed in. And so you want to get to the point where uh, you've been able to do that because you, you, you just can't be everywhere. Uh, you want to empower, empower them to be extensions of you. You know, the fact that you can't answer every single question, um, you know, because there's thousands that come in, you just can't do everything. So empower your top people to be able to do that for you and make decisions uh, on behalf of the business that are in the best interest of the business. They can brief you every day, but you know, they don't have to involve you in every single decision. Um, you know, every micro decision doesn't have to be on your shoulders. So empower your people um, to be able to do that. And then promote your strongest. Uh, there's often in landscape companies, you know, you have a crew leader, but who's second on that crew? You may have some really, really strong people that sit on your crews that have the potential. Uh, you know, we talked about in the first webinar when we're talking about leadership uh, and um, coaching potential. And here it really rings true, promote your strongest and identify who those key players are, those rock stars, and really help them foster growth within your company. Really, your business is your vehicle to success and really it's the vehicle to success for your team as well. Um, it is just so important that you understand that the uh, the company that you've built as an owner, um, as a uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, also resonate with the team uh, that's contributing to that success. They think of it as their own too, or at least you know if you've empowered them to do that. As a leader, make sure you're working as much as you do if you are working in the business you know if you're on the job site make sure you're working on the business uh, in an equal amount of time redefine your role as a leader and help people understand that uh, you're there as a scaffolding um, i think of it in terms of either scaffolding you know around your team or that upside um, upside down umbrella where you have all of your crews and your operations people in your office um, and you sit at the bottom of all of that and uh, you're kind of like the catch-all. So if there's anywhere that you need to pitch in, you do that. If there's anywhere that needs support, you're there for them. Redefining your role as a leader uh, is key to be able to working on the business versus in. Um, part of it's letting go of the controls uh, and letting your um, management team, your leadership team uh, around you uh, handle uh, the respective areas that they're responsible for. Have levels of authority, you know, crew leaders, supervisors, um, operations managers, production managers, scheduling managers. Uh, if your business uh, allows for that, if it's scaled in the appropriate way, uh, have levels of authority so it doesn't all have to be on your shoulders. And when it comes to sales, you know, of everybody that uh, that's listening right now, you know, think about it. Are, are you the main driver of the sales engine? Um, are you also on the job site? It's really hard to do all of those things. If your business can afford it and you have the ability to do it, um, invest in real salespeople, um, have a, a leadership team if you're able to do that. It builds value to your company when you work on the business, when you're working to improve your systems, when you're working to improve your um, standard operating procedures uh, or SOPs as they're known. Um, you know, you're always adding value or building value to the company when you're working on the business. You know, and it comes down to uh, successful landscape companies use software systems. You know, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a fact. There's proven efficiencies that come along with it, um, <laughs> headaches too, but um, successful landscape companies use software systems. Um, the success in systems comes along with uh, a budgeting or overhead recovery system, a sales management system or CRM, a customer resource management system, so that you can manage your sales pipeline. Uh, we talked about um, in the, Last week's webinar, um, managing your sales pipeline and um, 
you know, your prospect or customer's journey uh, is really important part of that. So having a software system that does that as well. Uh, a landscape design software and, you know, when we're talking here, it, have a professional system that allows you to build the, your plan and visualize so that your customer or prospect can really understand uh, a landscape design software system will help you uh, produce professional drawings that sell jobs. An estimating system that has a manageable cost book um, that allow you to have templates and those kinds of things. Being able to uh, introduce an estimating software system into your business uh, increases an incredible amount of uh, efficiency and creates a ton of capacity for your estimators. Uh, a system that also allows for contract management is huge. Um, there isn't one design build project that doesn't have a change order. Uh, and if there is, it's a unicorn. So have a contract management system that handles change orders and allow, just allows you to uh, do everything you need to do against the contract. And really what I've seen many successful landscape companies time and time again, the reason, one of the top reasons they're successful is because they've been tracking their jobs and doing the job costing on a regular basis. And when I say regular basis, it's a minimum of once a week they're looking at their um, job actuals. Tracking every day based on timesheets, but doing a regular um, job cost analysis on, on the, uh, the projects that are on the go. And then a billing system. So having an integrated billing system where, you know, based on the contracts that you have and the the work that has been done, being able to bill out uh, and have that tied it is all really, really important. And then a financial system to be able to take a look at your uh, income statement and your balance sheets so that you can make sound financial decisions based on the analysis that you're doing uh, and make real time uh, informed decisions. So take a look at some of the uh, the ROI around systems, adding just a sales management or a CRM software, you know, investing in just a, a CRM software, you know, you're looking at annually about 5,000 or maybe even more uh, a year. This doesn't include the, the efficiency rating, you know, just by being able to manage your sales pipeline, having uh, opportunities and prospects that don't slip through the cracks because you are managing uh, your sales pipeline and managing your customers using uh, a software package. Um, or by adding a, some landscape design software, you know, from sketching by hand to landscape design software, easily can be calculated as a 40% increase uh, in efficiency right there. An integration between systems, um, you know, between uh, your design system and your estimating software, uh, your estimating software uh, and your accounting software. You know, there's a part-time admin person, so consider that um, 20 to 30K annually, uh, plus an increase of 30 plus percent uh, in efficiency. And empowering your crews to track time and materials in real time. So, you know, not writing it down on paper, uh, and maybe that sheet gets back to the office so that someone can then enter it. Um, but having a, a way, a, a, a digital way, so either on a supplied tablet or a phone, so that the crew can uh, clock in and out of jobs and track the time and materials so that it goes back to the job uh, in real time. You know, being able to see that information uh, quickly and readily is super important and can just drive that amount of efficiency that you know successful landscape companies really um, have honed in on. So let's dig into overhead. Overhead, not over my head. Um, you know, there's that whole indirect uh, expense or overhead or direct expenses that are job related. Um, it's all about taking the time to go line by line uh, and understand what your overhead is. Uh, and if you're not using a system, uh, a, you know, a, a developed software system, um, whether it's a, you know, a construction-based system or a maintenance-based system, 
or something that's specific to the land is, landscape industry, do you really know if you're recovering overhead? And most of these systems will um, track overhead for you and help you recover the recover each uh, line by line item in, within your overhead. And are you using the right over, overhead recovery method for you? Uh, in the landscape design build world, the rule of thumb is a multiple overhead recovery system. Uh, some companies in the uh, that do the majority of their work as um, as maintenance or you know lawn care companies or mowing companies, they may um, stack on and recover overhead on their labor. So a labor only kind of recovery method. Um, that's okay too, but pick the one uh, that's right for you and stick to it. Um, don't change it um, mid-year, mid-season. Uh, you want to have a season, uh, multiple seasons to be able to compare uh, year over year so that uh, you can understand how you're doing. Um, at the end of the day, um, successful landscape companies recover their overhead. Uh, it's something that's passed on uh, to the client on every single job so that you're recovering um, those expenses. So that's considered your markup. You're going to mark up um, your project. You have your, your actual job cost. You're going to mark it up uh, on a percentage basis to recover overhead. And then you'll add a profit on top of that. Uh, so at the end of the day, just make sure you're recovering your overhead. That's what successful landscape companies do. Uh, there's a debate uh, in the best method to recover overhead uh, for equipment it, it, or, you know, is the equipment best placed in overhead or direct expenses? So if you do have a comment on that, I'd love you to uh, post that in the uh, Q&A box. Um, but the, uh, the debate is, uh, you know, if you're financing a piece of equipment like an excavator or a skid steer, um, you'll have that payment regardless if you're doing any work or not. <laughs> you know, it's not, uh, you still have to make those payments. And um, so does it get considered um, overhead at that point? Um, or are you trying to recover it in every single uh, job that you do? Uh, so that's an ongoing debate. Some industry experts are recommending equipment to be included um, overhead, as, I guess, especially if it's being financed. Uh, so definitely uh, consider that as, you know, we uh, wind down the season in 2019 and gear up for 2020 as you go through your budgeting process. Uh, think about how you are um, recovering your equipment costs. And where do you put it? I'd love to know uh, if you put that in your Q&A. Uh, some estimating trends, um, you know, really look at uh, standardizing your estimating process um, and, you know, analyzing uh, estimates or the estimating process for many landscape companies. Um, we've seen consistent uh, work area names or service names. Um, so in, you know, design build estimate, uh, you'll have work areas. So um, have consistent work area names. And if you're doing maintenance work, um, have consistent uh, service names. Uh, factor in general conditions. These, this is like mobilization time, um, yard time that you want associated to a job. Uh, and some people actually, some companies actually consider travel time as general conditions. Um, if you're ha if you have a design build um, job and you're at a job site that does not have uh, restroom access for your crews, then you may want to uh, have a portable restroom on site. That would be considered a general condition. Delivery. Uh, some actually include design time as general conditions. Uh, sales commissions within there as well. So factor in general conditions as part of your estimating process. Create templates um, for the estimates that you do. Um, so, um, you know, creating kits so that you can re reuse those and the types of work that you do. Um, but if you find yourself creating estimates for similar types of work and, you know, you're adjusting um, small pieces of that, like quantities and, you know, maybe a couple items here and there, uh, create templates for the estimates that you do. Um, so think of it that way where, you know, you can reuse a lot of the work that you've done so that you're not recreating the wheel every single time. Um, and keep uh, a clean and up-to-date 
uh, cost book. You know, vendor pricing is changing frequently. Um, and so try and keep a cost book and have someone dedicated to uh, making sure that cost book's up to date and, uh, you know, that the pricing's consistent and um, you've got the right uh, set of materials um, in your cost book. Um, building beautiful proposals is key and, you know, goes towards um, helping you win work, um, but helps your prospective client um, definitely um, understand the scope of work better and um, helps go towards the brand and brand experience that uh, we talked about in previous webinars. Um, include your logo in color. Um, don't make it black and white. And uh, I didn't put this part of it, but um, Make sure your logo is crisp uh, and not pixelated. So don't use a low resolution resolution version of your logo. Make sure that uh, it's a crisp, high resolution version of your logo in color. Um, personalize uh, greeting. Make sure you address the person that uh, you know the uh, the proposal or people that the proposal is uh, geared towards. Uh, remind your prospect why they should love you as part of the proposal. Uh, talk to them a little bit about your process. Th this is all done as part of your presentation, but the proposal is something that you're going to leave behind uh, and they're going to go through it, you know, probably more than once. So, uh, and without you there. So have that in there is why, um, and remind them why they should love you. Um, use language that they'll understand. Uh, technical language may be beyond some people um, and it might just put them in a state where um, they've disconnected uh, from your experience and uh, from your company. So use language that they'll understand. Uh, try and not complicate it with huge material and plant lists. Um, first of all, it opens up the conversation for a discussion that you just might not be uh, willing or ready to have. Uh, you'll find yourself having to justify, which, uh, you know, is a, you know, it's better not to uh, open up that can of worms. So try and not complicate it with huge material platelets. Again, it's going to be dependent on the uh, prospect or uh, client that you're working with. Some may be really keyed into that. Um, you know, this is more for residential on the commercial side of things. Uh, when you're dealing with property managers, this kind of it changes a little bit um, where pro some property managers want to have that level of detail. Um, for some relationships. I was working with a client in Michigan and the property uh, managers that they deal with there have great connections with um, property development companies and in some cases get better pricing and so they want to be able to see the, uh, the line by line price on some of these uh, materials and trees and plants so that um, they can compare and whether they can get better pricing or not. So, you know, um, but for, as a, from a residential um, kind of uh, filter, I would suggest not complicating a proposal with huge uh, material plant lists with quantities and those kinds of things. Uh, use watermarks and footers. And one of the things I, I would recommend is uh, when you are putting your proposal together and designing your proposal, uh, have a someone with a graphic design um, filter or experience, uh, take a look at that and uh, offer you some suggestions. Um, try and use your company's colors to reinforce your branding. Uh, that can go a long way as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, professional landscape designs and how they win jobs. Um, first of all, ditching um, the quick sketch. Um, you know, when you're there and you, know, you pull out a wrinkly piece of paper and you know, kind of sketch something real quick, that can help quickly visualize something, but um, you know, professional landscape design will sell more jobs. Um, and you know, if you're not looking at 3D um, yet, uh, or have been considering you're not sure and sitting on the fence, um, 3D definitely helps sell larger jobs. Um, and you know, I've seen some landscape companies um, do bits of the uh, of the design in 3D for the crew so that they can see, uh, on, especially on complex installs, um, and running it by uh, production manager or the operations manager, the um, 3D concept 
may in fact work out uh, some of the issues before you start to dig. And in this case, um, you know, the landscape company that I was working with, they did that on a regular basis and um, they used the 3D model uh, inside of the software to be able to uh, address some of those um, complexities uh, before the crew actually showed up. Um, so it saved a, a ton of efficiency and um, you know, opportunity cost later on by working out the details before they got on the job site. And then using landscape design software uh, to estimate, uh, you know, using takeoffs, it just makes things a lot easier uh, when you can use a software tool uh, to do your takeoffs for quantities and um, uh, for square footage and linear foot um, and, you know, quantities of plants and um, amount of, amounts of materials that you need for the estimate. Um, so being able to use takeoff tools inside of your software on the, right on the design uh, will speed up uh, your estimating time, just make life uh, easier overall. Let's talk about the job a little bit here. So change orders, tracking actuals, reporting, uh, and rep what reports to actually review. Um, so jobs uh, and tracking what matters. So what are some really important things that matter to track? Um, both billable and non-billable labor. Um, you know, when we talk about non-billable labor, um, you've got like weather delays, um, yard time uh, where there's um, you know time that's not attributed to the job you know um, they've you've got um, sick time or um, doctor's appointments and uh, so you can track time that way and have it go through as non-billable um, and those kinds of things so you know track where and what your crew is up to during the day and if they leave for whatever reason um, make them accountable for their entire day. So, um, you know, what's billable, what's paid and what's not paid. Tracking your materials, um, uh, you know, and design build jobs is extremely important to track the materials you're using on a daily basis. And uh, so know, it helps you know exactly where you're at um, every single day. Uh, I don't know any single design build uh, job that goes through without a change order, is it? Um, you know, a unicorn if it doesn't happen. How many change orders are you doing on average? Um, would love to know that. Um, are, are you tracking, uh, or you should be tracking by day, by week, uh, by month, by job, and then by all jobs. Um, so make sure that you are doing that. Successful landscape companies are tracking on a real-time basis. They're taking a look at and reviewing uh, on, on a day, every day or every other day uh, kind of basis rolled up into the week and then the month. Uh, so make sure that you're doing that. Um, really successful landscape companies track time and materials. Uh, tracking time is important so you know how much labor uh, you're using, you know how much to pay your people, um, but also tracking the materials that you uh, are using versus what you've estimated is huge as well. Uh, and those companies that are doing that uh, have invested in a software system to help them do this. They've empowered their crew to track their time and materials using an app on a supplied tablet or phone. And they look at the estimated versus actual data on at least a weekly basis, at the very least. Uh, and they review and analyze that data to make any necessary adjustments. And so those are some really key points. And if you're doing those, fantastic. If you're not, or you're working towards that, um, you know, just know that uh, it is a bit of a process in order to uh, get to the point where, you know, you're reviewing uh, track data on a daily basis. Um, it, it can be difficult to get um, crew leaders to, um, buy into the fact that uh, you'd like them to track their time and materials that they're using. Uh, now let's look at change orders. Um, change order language um, should be uh, inside the terms and conditions of the contract that's signed um, at the time of signing 
uh, for the project to move forward. So make sure that there is the change order language in your terms and conditions. Um, change orders are really any out of scope work. And so if there is a discussion about out of scope work, just set the expectation that the, that the work that is being suggested is out of scope and um, you know, can, we can discuss doing that. Um, but we would need to create a change order to adjust for uh, the cost involved. Change orders are substitutions, additions, deletions, and changes in quantities um, to anything that was signed as part of the contract uh, to do the work. Uh, and when to build change orders is a great question as well. I see a lot of landscape companies when um, there is a request for some kind of change um, that it's dealt with before work continues with that general area. So change orders created, uh, agreed upon uh, by both parties, it's signed and paid for be before moving forward. So, um, you know, it's not always possible and we know that, but um, if you try and keep that as a rule of thumb, uh, and, you know, sometimes it can be hard to kind of stop things um, but in some cases, the changes are big enough um, that uh, you be, need to be able to do that. And I just love this image so much where you have, um, you know, the small boat here as the original contract and this massive uh, yacht that it's connected to is the change order. And how often uh, for you does that, that happen? Uh, working with a client uh, a couple of years ago, um, they were working on a, on a luxury estate and um, through a series of 30 plus change orders, the project more than doubled in um, size, scope, and value. And uh, it can be more better represented in that, uh, that image right there. Um, who authorizes a change order to the contract? Are you empowering um, you know, your crew leader? Um, or do you have a site supervisor? Or does this have to funnel uh, all the way up to uh, someone in operations or to you uh, to be able to authorize um, changes to the contract. So uh, just think about who does that. Uh, I've seen some companies where, you know, um, changes up to a certain value um, or uh, you know, changes in the amount of hours um, can be handled by the crew leader foreman on site um, and beyond a certain amount need to have some level of approval by someone back in the office. So uh, think about who authorizes a change order uh, or a change to uh, the contract. Uh, the reports, um, you know, getting down and dirty with the details. Um, look at job profitability. So for that particular job, the uh, labor hours, the materials that you estimated versus actual, what's the variance um, compared to where you are in the progress of that job. You know, are you ahead um, or behind uh, as a result? Uh, is there a particular area that you're hemorrhaging on uh, labor and why? It gives you the ability um, to see uh, and to dig in and to start to understand why. And, you know, the job cost detail um, report. And really what that's looking at is all of the things that are on the contract uh, from labor, uh, materials, equipment, subcontractors, and any kind of miscellaneous items, uh, being able to really see what you've estimated versus what is actually come back uh, from the crew to be able to understand your cost uh, on that particular job. Employees, employee hours report, so broken down by uh, crew uh, and by employee to see where they were working, uh, what they accomplished in a specific time range, you know, using this for payroll, uh, using a, a two week range or however often you pay your people. Uh, so see what labor um, they worked on, what kind of labor types they worked on based on um, the jobs at the time. And for those that do maintenance, uh, to look at your service uh, profitability or break it down even further and look at visit by visit profitability uh, and see, you know, based on both um, materials and um, labor, especially in maintenance, uh, what you've estimated versus what 
actually came back. Job tracking offers a lot of challenges. And one of the biggest ones is getting timely and accurate info back from the crew. So, you know, how in the heck can you convince someone that doesn't want to do something to be able to do it? And um, getting buy-in is um, a really big deal. So convincing the crew that it's important to keep track of their work and um, not just important for them, but important for the company and, you know, helping them understand why it's important is, is a really big deal. And, and a, a good contributing factor to be able to um, motivate them to be able to um, track their time and the materials that they use. Keeping score um, uh, is a significant part of this. You know, what can't be measured uh, can't be improved. Uh, I've heard that uh, said time and time again. And, uh, you know, there's a really well known industry consultant, Marty Grunder, out of Ohio, that um, that uses this quite a bit. And um, he introduced the notion of uh, keeping score, um, you know, on a crew by crew and job by job basis, um, letting everybody know what the estimated amount of uh, labor hours were for that job and how many have you been used to date. Um, so uh, helping a crew and um, everyone else uh, know that, uh, you know, there's a goal in mind and, you know, maybe even offering uh, incentives to, uh, to beat that. Uh, and, you know, really introducing the notion or fostering the notion of working together to build a successful business. Uh, that's hugely important. Uh, and uh, hugely important to uh, helping the crews and those involved in doing the tracking and um, doing the measuring to be able to do that. Um, getting good uh, tracking data back from the crew, uh, gosh, it, you know, if you can offer incentives for those that provide full and complete timesheets, um, you know, there are landscape companies that are doing that and offering um, incentives, um, uh, both perk-based, um, monetary incentives, um, recognition type of incentives. Um, so, you know, there, it could be value-added incentives versus, you know, actually having a hard cost type of incentives. Um, but look at incentivizing full and complete timesheets. Um, explain why it's important for the business to keep score. You know, it's um, keeping score so that, you know, you're managing costs and trying to uh, maximize the amount of profitability for the company to be successful. Uh, but helping uh, everybody understand why it's important um, for the business to keep score. Publish the scores. Um, you know, I, even if it's um, not by having a screen inside uh, the shop, um, post on a whiteboard uh, on a job by job, the crew that's working on those jobs, what their estimated versus actual hours to date are. And, um, you know, if there's, if there's not a, 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 not a goal to work towards, uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, trying to work in the dark. Having an end goal in mind uh, is really important. You know, there, there's a golf analogy, you know, um, you know, you, those that play golf, um, each hole has a par, you know, that's the goal, you know, a par four and trying to uh, do that hole in four strokes or less. And, uh, you know, if you're bogeying, you know, you've gone over. So uh, try and uh, publish those scores so everybody knows um, where you're at. Um, keep score um, of full and complete timesheets. So, um, you know, keep a top three or top five or top 10 um, list of um, employees that have full and complete timesheets for the week uh, and publish it so everybody knows. Investing in quality control uh, is gigantic uh, in customer experience, in how uh, the crew feels about the work that they do. You know, everybody on the job is uh, responsible uh, to do good work and to do the best that they absolutely can and provide a standard of quality um, that, that, that the customer has come to expect. But take it a step further and empower someone on your crew or, uh, you know, one person on every crew 
to be like the quality control officer. And, you know, they do a, a walk through uh, every day to make sure that, uh, you know, things are to the standard. And, you know, you work with that person or those people to so to help them understand what your quality standard is. And so, you know, the crew's not walking away until that standard is met. Or if there's work that needs to be done in order to bring the level of uh, quality up to the standard, then make sure those notes are brought back to the office and someone there understands um, that there's some work to do as it, from a quality perspective. Can incentivize quality with crews in the same way, recognizing quality um, through, um, you know, at your company meetings, uh, at your tailgate talks, um, you know, kind of huddle sessions, like those kinds of things, um, offering a, a you know, dollar-based or monetary incentive with quality. Um, you know, it's a little more subjective, so, you know, have, uh, definitely have some criteria around that uh, if you are going to incentivize, but um, think about incentivizing quality. And remember, exceeding quality expectations drives customer lifetime value. And part of that lifetime value of a customer is the referrals that they make um, to their friends and family and neighbors um, to recommend you to them so that, you know, you can do work for them. Uh, it all goes, uh, part of that customer lifetime value is equated um, through the value of referrals that they bring. So keeping score um, in, the, uh, in the shop, if you have one or in the office, keep labor hour charts by job and crew, estimated versus actual. I, I keep talking about this, but it goes so far to motivate um, your crews that I really think it, it's a powerful thing to do. It really kind of opens up some transparency uh, inside of the business, so really important to do that. Um, it informs and motivates um, everybody working on um, as part of the team there. Um, and share estimated versus actuals uh, the hours with the team so that um, they can understand the position of each job. And when it all comes down to it, what gets measure, measured can be improved. And if you work in a continuous improvement approach, we are regularly looking for ways to improve efficiency um, and uh, increase capacity, then you know, if you can measure something, then you can work to improve it and you can find ways to do that. Really like to thank you um, for spending time with us. If you do have some questions, please uh, put them in the Q and A um, box. Um, we had a really good time um, putting on this webinar series uh, for the community. I, I want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your uh, busy schedule. I know it's really tough to do as the season winds down, as you're kind of wrapping things up. Uh, so thank you very much for spending some time with us. Uh, if you would like to keep the conversation going or you do have questions, uh, I'm Joe Salami here with Dynascape Software. You can get me at 1-800-710-1900, extension 279. Uh, you can get me direct or shoot me a text at 905-639-9668. My email address is jsalami at dynascape.com. Our website is there, dynascape.com. Um, if you're new to the community or would like to see uh, some pieces of uh, what we are all about, um, let's schedule a call today and talk about it a little bit more. I'd love to uh, talk to you and get to know you a little bit better and um, see if there's somewhere that Dynascape or I can add value to your landscape business. Thank you so much. Uh, until next time, um, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.